just cut that out. That'll, that'll all be gone. And we'll also cut out this admin. So let me just do all that admin stuff at the beginning. Um, so audio recording, please try and get it working via Electopia. And if you don't get it working, please send them lots of emails so they get denial of service. <laughs> or ring them up. Uh, and textbooks, lots of people have been asking about the textbooks, and I keep forgetting to talk about it. They're, so the short story is there is no textbook for this course. But the long story is a bit longer than that. The long story is, uh, if you, uh, this course involves a whole lot of things. It involves a bit of design, thinking about design. It's very hard to find books about design. Well, it's not hard to find. It's very hard to find a single concise book that has everything we want to say about design. There's bazillions of books about design because it's so interesting. It's a bit about learning Java. Now, you can just pick up a random book and there's a 50-50 chance it's about how to program in Java. That's how many how to program in Java books there are. So if you want a book that teaches you how to program in Java, just go to any bookshop. Go to a remainded bookshop, like that one in the centre of Sydney near Central Station, you know, near that tunnel that sells books for 50 cents each. And I bet you could put a, a whole lot of how to program in Java books. I initially taught myself ooh, many years ago how to program in Java by reading a, or a book called something like Teach Yourself How to Program in Java in, in One Day or something like that. It's the worst book I've ever read. Um, <laughs> But still, it taught me how to program in Java. So um, just as a million books, Java, them, Sun themselves, Sun slash Oracle themselves, put out a, a tutorial trail. So if you go to the, you know, um, www.java.com, would that be it? To get to the start of the trial? I think it's www.java.com, or just go to the Sun site or the, or the um, uh, Oracle site. And there's a million tutorials, and you can just go through them, and they're guided tutorials aimed for people at all levels teaching you all things. So there's a mazillion resources about it on the internet, because it was the internet programming language. It was a language that was invented for the internet, more or less, and was popularized at the same time the internet was popularized. So the internet, half the internet is devoted to teaching people how to program in Java. So just learning Java syntax should be straightforward. They did use a book last semester. You could look up, and you could probably buy it cheaply. Nah, mm, it's OK. We didn't want to make it a textbook, because it's not brilliant. But you could use that book to teach yourself Java. Um, yeah? Um, I just wanted to recommend a book. Uh, sure. Joshua Block's Effective Java. Yeah. It's a really good book. If you already know the basics of Java syntax and stuff, how to format your code and how to write code that works effectively. Uh, yeah, we'll be talking more about Joshua Block later in the course, actually. But yeah, he's one of the um, original Java people. So his book's a good book. And there's lots of good books about how to write good Java. And I've actually got a bibliography of books that I've been reading over the holidays to refresh my mind. And I've got probably about 20 really cool and interesting books that are Pitch more at the level that Liam's talking about there, which are books more about um, not just how to make the language work, because I assume you'll know most of that already from C and you'll pick the rest up quite quickly yourself, um, but uh, about how to use Java effectively and use, do the things that Java does well, not just do the things that C does well dressed up as Java. Um, so um, there's lots of good books out there on that, and I'll put my bibliography up so you can read those with little comments on each book. But I think the hardest part of the course, or the tricky part of the course, is probably understanding how object-oriented design works in the first half of the course. And in the second half, remember, we'll be looking at algorithm design. Uh, so for object-oriented design, I have a favorite book. And it's really old. And it's by Bertrand Meyer, who's just completely awesome. And it's called Object-Oriented Software Construction. Now, this is the first. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, that was called Object-Oriented Software Construction, first edition. He's written a second edition. It's a very popular book. He's written a second edition, which is nine times as big. And it's also really good. But actually, I prefer the first edition, which is crazy. I don't know why. So, um, so you can get either edition. I got this on eBay or um, Amazon or something like that for like 20 cents, because it's the first edition, and everyone likes the second edition. So, um, so that's quite a good book. You don't need it, but if you just wanted to read about object-oriented um, uh, design, principles of, you could read that book. Um, and as I say, I've got a bibliography of other, of other books I'll put up. For algorithm design, when we get to it in the second half of the course, again, there's no textbook, because we'll just tell you the things you need to know, and Wikipedia is great, and there's lots of online resources that'll fill in stuff. But if you wanted to learn more about algorithm design, I couldn't recommend more highly a book called The Algorithm Design Manual by Stephen Skiena from um, Stony Brook, I think. Does anyone know where he is, actually? He's a big guy in the ACM programming competitions. He's completely awesome. This book is completely awesome. There's a second edition out that I haven't read yet 
The first edition, I think, was pirated and scanned and PDFs of it escaped onto the internet. So there's free PDFs of it everywhere. But the guy's so nice and the book so, is so good, you should probably buy a book or at least send him some money in the mail because it's an awesome book. Uh, the first edition is fantastic and I assume the second edition is even more fantastic, the algorithm design manual. And again, I'll write that in the bibliography. So that answers the question about textbooks. Essentially, there are none um, to the girl that was out. Essentially, there's no official ones, but there's lots of good books you could read if you want extra resources. So. And if anyone ever finds a book they think would be a good textbook for the course, please tell me, because I'd love to have a single book that we could just toddle through. That would be really good. Okay, is there anything else? Pair programming. Yeah, last thing to talk about, just admin before we jump in the lecture, is pair programming. Um, as you know, Every bit of programming you do in the course until the final exam is supposed to be pair programming. And I talked about it a bit in the first week and over the next couple of weeks we'll be talking more and more about how to do it effectively. But can I just remind you that that's what we expect you to do. So we don't expect you to go with your partner and each work separately on your code and then try and merge it together. We don't expect you and your partner to sit on two terminals near each other working. We expect you and your partner to sit next to each other physically and have one terminal open and one keyboard and one mouse. Now, I've heard stories that for the first design task, some pairs didn't even see each other and then at marking time, <laughs> there were two versions of the assignment to mark, one done by each partner in the team. Now, that's just completely not on because that's not what we want you to do. We don't want you to write code. We want you to learn how to pair program. And if you're a really good programmer already, you'll probably resist doing that because it will seem strange and new. But can I encourage you to do it because it's really in your interest to learn how to do it. We have some marks which we're handing out for something called citizenship. Do you remember that? And that's about helping others, helping the course, do, you know, pitching in, pulling along with the sort of the course spirit and the theme of the course, helping the whole society rather than just helping yourself. Um, so people doing solo work or not helping their partner or People that just hog the keyboard and their partner just watches or anything like that, that's not good citizenship. So you might get good assignment marks, but you won't be getting good citizenship marks. And for us, that's more important. I'd rather you write crappier code at half the speed together than to write some fantastic thing, but all by yourself and be dysfunctional in a pair. So I just want to make that really, really clear. Is that absolutely clear to everyone? So the tutors are going to be on the lookout for that. Um, because we really don't want you to do it. Now, it's not as though, though, I don't want you to think we're making you do something horrible that won't help you. I think if you give it a go, you'll be amazed by how effective and how good it is. Um, and one of the students yesterday um, said, I should read the Wikipedia page. We'll give everyone a link to the Wikipedia page on pair programming, which I've done here, because it explains pair programming really well, heaps better than I ever could. And it's really exciting. And it's got lots of really good ideas in there and talks about the advantages of it and the disadvantages of it. And um, let me just tell you, it's modern programming practice. You should definitely do it. Go to the Wikipedia page and read it and see if that inspires you. Um, but it's absolutely what we expect you to do, and it should be fantastic. And if you're stuck with a dud partner for your um, design tasks, then this is now going back to 1927 group work, those of you that did 1927 with me. If you remember how group work works, here's two worlds. You tell me which is the world we want you to be in. World one is my partner is hopeless, lazy, inaccessible something. I'm very angry with them. Ah, I will sit and fume and silently hate them. We will hand our assignment in, then I will ask to have our marks adjusted. So this is what I would like to call the complain approach. <laughs> and the second approach is, hmm, my partner is blah, 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 not working for whatever reason. What can I do to fix that? I will do everything I can think of to fix that problem. <sighs> now, which world do we prefer? <laughs> the complain world. No, it's not, it's not all about the marks and stuff like that. So our idea is if, part, if pair programming or group work isn't working for you, that's not a surprise. It will be hard for everyone, and it will not work as well as you want it to work for a huge number of people. And every time you do it, it'll get a bit better, not because your partners will be better and better, but because you yourself will learn better group working skills. And the thing about group working, just like the thing about families, is when there's a problem, we don't go away and complain about it and try and get compensation for the problem. What do we do in a family when there's a problem? Yeah. <laughs> no, 
No, we don't yell. We don't yell. <laughs> what do we do? We try and we try and fix it. Yes, we try and fix it. That's right. Because the important thing is we want a functional family. We don't want to work out who's in the right and who's in the wrong and who's blamed and who's not blamed. But we actually want the problem to go away. So I want you to learn good group work skills, and you learn good group work skills by doing group work and making it work. You will find it hard, as I went on and on about last year in 1927, for those who did it. You will find it hard. I want you to take that as a challenge. I don't want you to take that as a reason not to do it. I want you to take that as a challenge and think, hmm, I am an elite programmer. I am so smart. I can do these amazing things with my Perl stuff. And yet, I'm not able to organize groups properly. Somehow, when the groups, I get together in groups, it doesn't work very well. That is a skill that I want to be elite at as well. I will now work on group working skills. Because remember, when a group doesn't work, it's whose fault is it? No. From your point of view, whose fault is it? Yes, from your point of view, it's your own. But absolutely, it's a collective responsibility. So no matter what your partner is doing in the group, suppose you, we were going to have a meeting and you, well, let's be honest, we had a meeting and I didn't turn up. Okay. Yes, you've partnered with someone who's really unreliable. Does that mean you just give up and complain and go away and do your own private thing? No, 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 no. You start to think, what can I do to solve the problem? It's not that you should be solving the problem. It's not that you're in the wrong in any sense, but you've got a problem, you're an engineer, now you've got to try and solve that problem. And the problem is, hmm, I've got an unreliable partner, so I'll have to work out ways of having meetings with them where maybe I'll have it immediately after the tune, because he's already there, so he can't walk away. Or maybe I'll find out he's forgetful, so I get his mobile phone number and I ring him up. Maybe I'll find where he lives and I stalk his house. <laughs> I don't know. But somehow, just use your engineering problem solving skills. Think about why the group's not. Maybe it's not working. Maybe we're having a group meeting and you keep not turning up. Maybe that happens. He doesn't come, not because he's forgetful, but because I am obnoxious. So maybe I've got to change something about myself. Or maybe it's because when we sit down, all I do is criticize you. Or we have different working styles. You want to do it all at the end, I want to do it all at the beginning. You know, somehow we need to, not by blaming anyone, somehow we need to work, talk about it together and resolve it and work out a compromise so the whole damn thing works. And it's hard, so you guys are smart, so you can solve hard problems, and it's a problem you're going to have to solve because you'll have it forever. So, uh, uh. anyway, I've talked about group work enough. No more about group work because today we're talking about templates. Here we go. Uh, not templates. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're not talking about templates except just then. Today we're talking about interfaces. All right. We were looking at classes yesterday and we were comparing them with ADTs, our, our familiar ADTs, and we saw that essentially a Java class gives you everything an ADT gave you in terms of abstraction and information hiding. And it was sort of better because it lets you specify on a per member level the precise protections you wanted things to have. And it, you were sort of specifying explicitly in the language rather than using incidental language features like the way that hash includes work and tricks about how you can um, split definitions of um, pointers to structs and things. Rather than using accidental language features to achieve a result of isolation and encapsulation, where it has explicit measures. So we really liked it. And it did all sorts of nice things. It was really cool. But actually, we can do more. In Java, we can have something that's even better than ADTs as you've come to know them so far. And we're going to lead up to this by looking at um, something called uh, interfaces. Do you remember Fury of Dracula, your big assignment from last year? <laughs> of course you do. And how it happened was you would write a hunter, and 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 you would write a vampire. And we would combine them all together. Now, your hunters were all called hunter.c and hunter.h, hunter.c and hunter.h. So to combine them together, we probably had to do a bit of magic. We probably had to rename them behind the scenes to hunter1, hunter2, hunter3, and go through your files renaming stuff. Then we probably had to recompile them and join them in that way. We probably had to do some sort of tricky special thing because as far as um, C is concerned, you can't have two types called hunter. It's just one type defined in one spot. So if you've got four different ADTs, you can't do that. You can only do one. So we had to do magic behind the scenes. How nice it would be if we could say, well, you've got a hunter, you've got a hunter, you've got a hunter, you've got a hunter, but we can just put them all together and it all just sort of works without us having to fiddle and diddle and rewrite programs and rename things behind the scenes if it all just worked. In other words, how nice if we could have more than one implementation of the hunter interface, you know, the ADT interface, live in the system at one time. In C, we can only have one live, can't we? So we recompile it with a new one and recompile it with a new one. But how nice it would be if we could have multiple hunters, multiple things that satisfy the hunter interface, but they're all sitting together. And we don't have to pull them in and out. And that's what interfaces are going to give us. Now, I had an example of it. Um, 
Yeah, the acceptance testing for design task two that you guys are working on now. If you look at the acceptance tests that Rupert wrote, they're really quite clever. What he's done is he's, I'm going to draw a picture. He's got something which he calls an interface. So you know in uh, Java we say public class, say we have public class test. And that's going to create a class called test, which at runtime we can use to create a whole lot of test objects. But the objects will all be the same. Yeah, yeah, they'll all have the same functions in them. They'll all, but they're just different instances of the same thing. Well, what Rupert wanted to have was lots of tests. So you could have like a test, um, test rear wheel, test front wheel. Uh, hard test, easy test, ruthless test, test initial state, test it after 50 turns, test you can unlock it, test it still. So you wanted to have this whole library of tests. And what he thought would be really nice is if he could over here write each test as a separate class somehow. So that's test one and a test two. And they're all different classes. They've all got different code in them. They all do different things, perform different tests. But somehow then he has some sort of umbrella thing that goes through executing these one at a time. So in other words, he thought, what would be really nice is if I could have an array of tests. Just have an array in Java, and every element of the array is a reference, is a reference to um, an object. And every object is a test, and he'll just iterate over the array. So take the first element of the array, suppose the array is called tests. He'll do something like tests, zero, which talks about the first object here, and he'll run the test on. Test zero dot run. That will run the first test. And then he would like to say test one dot run. And that would run the second test. And so, on. so that would be quite nice because that gives him a sort of general structure and then later on you could write a test 17 and you could write a test backwards and you could write a test upside down and we could just keep adding everyone's tests to it. We wouldn't have to recompile or rename things. We just keep adding them, compiling them, throwing them into the mix and only the master program would have to have new tests added to the suite that we wanted run and they'd all just be sort of thrown into the mix. That's what we quite like to do. But the reason that um, in C, for example, this would be slightly problematic to do, you could do it in one way, but the way we want you couldn't do it, is these all have to be pointing to objects of different classes. Because these all have to be pointing to objects which run different tests. How can you have an array of things of, diff of different things? You know, like an array is a whole lot of things of the same type. And also all the things that it points to in here, they've got to have a run function in them. So we can just do this inside a loop, iterate over the whole thing. So what Java interfaces let you do is exactly that. They let you say, make a new object, say um, test simple, mm, how am I going to draw this? At the moment, each class, for example the class test1, each class is a type. So test one is of type test one. And if you want to have an array, you could have an array of test ones. If there was a, you had a class, it's a pretty stupid name for a class, isn't it? It should be called test easy or something, a bit more informative. You could have an array of test easies. With interfaces, Java lets us say that each class can actually belong to more than one type. So what we could do is something like this. We'd say public interface test. And an interface looks just like a class. It's a, it generates a new type. So a type called test. And actually, let me write it up. Public interface test. And this is going to look just like a .h file in C. So it's not going to be a class, but it's going to be a type. Interface test is, um, I don't know, it, it's just all the functions it has. So maybe it's got public, uh, void, run. That's a function. 
But I'm, I'm closing it here. I'm not giving an implementation of the function. And I'm just sticking that in a file called test.java. So it looks just like a class, except instead of saying class, I said interface. And then in the next file, which is, say, called test easy, java, this file, I'm going to say public class test easy. This is going to be a class. And then I'm going to say implements test. What that tells us is that I'm about to define a new class, yeah, just like normal, and this class implements the test interface. So it's signaling to you that anyone that expects something that satisfies the test interface would be quite happy to accept one of these guys. Now what's the test interface? Public void run. So this now has to implement public void run. So we might write public void run. And now we're going to write our run test. And it might be as simple as lock L equals new lock. Uh, you have to give some parameters, don't you? Whatever they are, stick them in. You know you have to give parameters when you create a lock. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then assert. What can we just assert for a very simple test? Not uh, is locked. No, not L dot is locked. So that's a very, very simple test. Creates a lock called L and then checks that when it's created, it's not locked because that's a default create. OK, so here we have um, a simple function called run. It's in the class called test easy. So if I create an object of type test easy now, and, then, and I call that object t. And then I said t.run will run this function and perform that test. Now the interesting thing is that test easy is of type test easy, but it's also of type test. This means it belongs to more than one type, which means any function that's expecting an object of type test can accept a test easy. So now Rupert set up his array, and he set up an array of type test. Go and look at the code. Test uh, blah blah equals test suite. He had a suite of tests, and they were all tests. But actually, the objects that populated this array, none of them were actually from the test class. There's no test class. They were all from other classes that implemented the test interface. So you could write 57 other classes. Does that make sense? Hmm, I don't think I'm explaining it very well. So let me give, explain it another way. Um, We write our car class, uh, and we were writing it the other day. And once we've got um, a car class, we can make objects of type car. And they can be passed to any function that expects a car. So maybe someone, maybe it's you, Jocelyn, maybe you write a function uh, called uh, car transporter. You know those awesome things where people drive lots of cars on and they drive along and it's like a truck full of cars? That's fantastic. I love seeing that. It's like an array of cars moving down the street. So you ride a truck transporter, and it's got a function called add car, where you load new car, where you load another car onto the transporter. And that gives us a transporter object. We could load cars into the transporter object, and we could pass it and do something with it or whatever. So it's accepting objects of type car. My <laughs> That's very good. Caution, cable. <laughs> well done. That's excellently good. Um, uh, okay, so my brother-in-law, remember he bought a new Peugeot, it completely sucks for all the reasons that we've talked about before, uh, because basically because it's a leech attractant. <laughs> and um, uh, I don't want to implement an arbitrary class, a car object. Let's make it more specific. Let's say you create a class called Peugeot.java, and that builds a car which has leech attractant properties. And you write a class called 
I don't know many cars, Leyland P76. <laughs> and that makes a car that happens to be a Leyland P76 that has all the normal features except doesn't have the go feature, I think. And you ride a car called Prius. It doesn't have a brake feature? It does. No, it does have a slow, doesn't it? It must. It does regenerative braking, but it must have a pedal. Yeah, it probably just wasn't working properly. It wasn't working. Ah, is that why they had that recall? Okay. You're, you're a Prius. So we've got a, you guys write some code that represents a Prius, that represents a, a Leyland P76, that represents um, a, a Persia. Now, <laughs> I would like to be able to load all of those cars onto your car transporter. But what's the type of the function, load? Remember I was saying before it takes in a car? I'd have to change it now to say it takes in a Peugeot. But then we'd have to write another function to take in a, a Leyland P76, and another one to take in a, a, a Prius, and another one to take in a Jaguar XJS, or something like that. And every time we thought of a new sort of car, I'd actually have to go through rewriting all the functions that used cars, which would be insane, adding another thing to a big long case statement or giving them a new function. So we don't want to do that. How we do that in Java is we'd say, class Jaguar XJ86 implements car. Class, what were you? Nothing. You were nothing. We've got to think of another funny car. Does anyone know another funny car? Ford Pinto. Ford Pinto? What's that funny? Go-Go Mobile. Go -Go -Mobile. <laughs> Class Go-Go Mobile uh, implements car. Class Peugeot implements car. Class Leyland P76 implements car. Class Prius implements car. So, we, and we can, everyone can think of their favorite car, Herondel or the DeLorean or whatever it is, and just say it implements car, then Java is prepared to accept it simultaneously as a being of type Jaguar XJS and of being of type car. So if, if Jocelyn has a function that expects cars, all of these cars can be loaded into that. And if you have a function that only takes Jaguar XJSs, only your car can be loaded into that. Does that make sense? And you can make your objects, you can, sorry, your classes can implement multiple interfaces. Why would you ever want to do that? Well, here's an example uh, that I was thinking of as I was driving in today. Um, there was a transit lane. And in the transit lane, buses could go, but I couldn't go. And I think if you had some sort of function that policed who was in what lane and things like that, um, you know, enter the transit lane function or something, it presumably would only take things of type bus, I was thinking initially. And of course, you can't load a bus onto your car transporter, so bus is not of type car. Yeah. But then I thought, oh, okay, now we've got a problem. What about a taxi? Because a taxi can go in the transit lane, but a taxi is also a car and low on your thing. So then I thought, okay, so we don't have, we don't say the transit lane only allows things of type bus. We say the transit lane only allows things of type transit vehicle, which is an interface. And we say bus implements transit vehicle, but it doesn't implement car. XJS implements car, but it doesn't implement transit vehicle. Taxi implements car and it implements transit vehicle. So taxis. Does that make sense? So it's very nice. We're trying to model actual things. So we're sort of allowing them to belong to multiple. Does that all make sense? That's what we call an interface. So interfaces are pretty cool. Let's look at some code now. How are we going for time? We've got lots of time. Uh, oh, yeah. I uh, just wanted to talk about interfaces just for one second before we actually did code. Just going back to our old C days now. We don't need any. This isn't a Java specific thing. It's just something to notice. Every time we make an abstract type, Every abstract type has three interface functions that are just there always. And one of them we sort of talked about, which was new. You can't have an abstract type without a new type. And actually in the C days, we'd have had to have some sort of free or dispose interface because you know, we had to look after our own housekeeping seat, but we don't have to do that anymore. But there's actually two more functions that every interface has, whether it was stacks or queues or anything we've ever written before that's an abstract type. It had two extra functions that you didn't even know that you were giving it. And you didn't even write them in the, your source code. But actually, there were two functions defined for that type already. Can anyone think just what one of them is? One function that every abstract type has, and you don't write it yourself in C, you just get it for free. Put your hand up if you got it. Constructor? Constru yes, so there's three. One of them's constructor, but there's two more. A 
I get, uh, you'd probably want to give it a get method, but different ones might have different get methods. This is something universal that everything would have. It's like sunroof. You'd probably expect every car to have a sunroof, but some cars, I don't know why, don't put them on. It's obviously a massive, you know, it's such a good thing to have in. But you can't be absolutely sure everyone will have a get method. But yeah, it's a good idea to put them in. So that's a good point. But then I'm asking for something even more universal than that, something that even if you don't want to put it in, you get it. A function that you didn't want to give many functions, you just make a type. You don't give any functions in the interface. You still have two put in for you. Execute. execute um, well, you execute the function. I like that you're thinking outside the box. <laughs> uh, it's not quite there, but it's outside the box like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, every, I mean, all the functions. Uh, <laughs> you're tempting me to talk about functions as first-class citizens and functional languages, but I won't. I'm going to resist it. But it's really interesting. I will just talk about it for a split second. That in some languages <laughs> here in Java, you notice we're now giving a lot more attention to data. We've sort of shifted away from the procedural way of thinking about things and think in terms of thinking about programs as this happens, then this happens, then this happens, some sort of procedural hierarchy. And we're now thinking about it as relationships between pieces of data is our paradigm for thinking about it because it turns out to be just a useful way of thinking about problems. It's just as valid as the other one, but it turns out to be a fairly useful one and doesn't get as cluttered and as complex as quickly as the other one does, so it lets you deal with bigger problems. But Another um, thing that some people do in language design is they say, well, actually, we'll, make, we'll give more emphasis to functions, too. So instead of functions being here and operating on data, we say that well, everything's sort of the same, man. And functions can actually operate on functions. So they have the same sort of status as data. Yeah, and in which case, you can have executes and things like that which take in a function and execute the function and things like that. So that's really cool. And languages like Haskell or functional programming languages do that. But let's not worry about that now. Two functions, can anyone think? In every interface. I'll give you a clue if you haven't got it. Oh, yes? Um, you can give it a name. All of them have a name. They all have a name? Yes, that's good. That wasn't what I was looking for, but yes, absolutely every function has a name. So what have they got in common? We're hunting for that. But there's two things you can actually do with them. Uh, check arguments. Check their arguments. Uh, there's two things, uh, functions you can give to every type. So yeah, certainly for every function you can check its arguments. You know it's return type? You know it's return type, yeah. For every function you know it's return type. But I'm thinking, what are two functions that are there? Not things you can do to functions. Comparison. Comparison. Who said that? Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Given any two things in C, C lets you put double equals between them. So if you make a class ADT of type Hunter, so you've got your hunter type, and somewhere up here I go hunter um, Van Helsing equals new uh, hunter Mina equals new. Uh, then I can say if I know H is equal to Mina, then do something. Every type comes with a built-in equality sign that lets you compare two elements of that type and determine if they're the same or not. And that gets stuck in the interface whether you want it or not. Now in C, with your abstract types, when will two abstract types be equal? When will, when will H be the same as Mina? When they, point to the same. when they point to the same thing. So let's make that. That's a really good answer. Thanks, George. Uh, here's Mina. Her name is Mina. What other information did you store in your hunter? Is she dead? No. Maybe that's all the information you stored inside. And then you have another guy, and you call, you, make, you create a new one. This is H1. This is H2. What's to stop you? If you made a new one and said their name was Mina, are they dead? No. And if I said, is H1 equal to H2, are they equal? No, they're not equal. Because it's a pointer to a struct, and pointers are only equal if they point to the same thing. So this is um, comparing if they're pointing to the same objects, is not comparing the values stored in the objects. And it's the same in Java. If you've got two objects, you automatically get an equals on them to determine if one of them is equal to the other one. You get an equals by using this. Java will only say they're equal if what? They point to the same object. That's right. 
It's a, it's a very important thing to understand because sometimes you might have made two objects that have the same values inside them and you might think they're the same, but Java won't unless they're the same object. Let me make it really clear. If you said, I don't know, x equals 6, y equals 6, and then you say if x is equal to y, what's C going to say? Yes. Yes. But they might not be the same 6, might they? They might be stored in different spots. They might be represented in different ways. It would be insane for the compiler to do it, but they might be. But when um, C compares primitive things like this, it compares them by value. Let's look at a Java example now. What if I said um, string S1 equals hello and string S2 equals args 0. Remember args is an array of strings passed into the function on the command line when you've got main. Uh, I'll top of the function up here just so it's really clear. Class uh, week 2 um, static void main string array thereof args. Okay, so args is defined inside main, and I strip the first argument out, which will be a string. And if you call this function saying uh, w2 hello, and this says if s1 is equal to s2, explode. <laughs> That's the world's messiest program. That's just. Um, is it going to explode? String 2 has arg 0. Arg 0 is the string hello. String 1 has a string hello. Is string 1 equal to string 2? No. In Java, no. What's that? In C, well, let's think about in C. In C, how is the string represented? As a pointer. As a pointer to an array. So if you had two different arrays, in C, each containing the same letters, and you compared them in C, will they be the same? No. no. You'd have to use a function that compared on value rather than pointed. What would you have to use? String compare. Yeah. It's exactly the same in Java, because in Java, strings are objects. So they're references. So to compare them, they've both got to be pointing to the same thing. So will this explode? I don't know. You should try it out. What about this? What if I said, This creates a new string object. This creates a new string object. <laughs> yes, it's a tricky one. They will be equal, and they're. E oh, you going to say? I think if you do that, it's not going to work. Can you use the dot equals? Uh, oh yeah, we'll get to dot equals in a sec. That's really good. You're you're going exactly in the right direction. Um, they will be equal in C if and only in Java or in C actually because they both use pointers to things. They will be equal if and only if these guys point to the same area of memory that contains hello. Will the compiler create two different things and have them pointing in two different spots? Will the compiler have them pointing in the same spot? Well, it's a compiler choice. But C is actually quite strict, uh, Java is quite strict about this. I don't know if if it, to what extent it's standardized, but I think it's even standardized in the language, that string literals like this, the compiler has a duty to make sure that it never creates two different string literals which contain the same value. So in Java, the compiler will notice that it's already got a hello, and instead of setting a new area aside, when it sets up this pointer, it'll point to the old area. So actually in Java, when you compare string literals, double equals will work. But what if they're not both string literals? Then it's not the compiler's job to make that happen. If I said arg uh, zero here, well, no. No, no, now we're in different land. This is a string set up not by the compiler at compile time. Well, even, even the VM might have a duty to canonically store strings. It doesn't have a duty? No, no, it's only the compiler. Okay, so 
they probably won't point to the same thing. But they could. So the problem with getting it equals automatically is that programmers will now use it, but actually equals only makes sense for primitive types. For non-primitive types, you've got to think about it because it might not have your intuitive meaning of what it means. Java does have a function that forces things to be stored canonically. I can't remember what it's called. Does anyone remember what it's called? String dot something. There's some dot function which will give you a canonical representation of some strings. Because if you've got a whole, suppose, uh, let me make it really clear. Suppose you've got an array of strings and you wanted to check, you've got one new string and you wanted to check if it was already in the array. And suppose there's a million elements in the array and each string is a million elements long. It's contained? No, no, not contains. No, this, this is a canonical thing, not the substring thing. Um, to compare two strings by value, What's that called? Uh, char char you can use char at to compare them a character at a time. That's right. To compare two strings by, um, by value, how much work is that? The length of the string. To compare two pointers, how much work is that? Constant, one tick. So it's really convenient if you're going to be constantly passing through an array of strings and you want to check if something's in it. It's a real pain to actually do string compares the whole way through. It'd be nicer just to do pointer compares. So Java has this nice little thing that I can't remember what it's called, that I'll put it up in the notes, which when you create a string, you say, um, uh, give me a canonically stored version of this string, which means it checks if it's already created one, and if so, it just gives you a pointer to the one it's already created in which case you can actually just do pointer compares to pass along the... Right, anyway, I'm ranting and ranting. But I just wanted you to know, I, I didn't want to tell you all about them, I just wanted to alert you to the fact that you get this double equals, but it might not behave like you think. You also get one other thing. It's not quite a function, I guess. Uh, question. Yes? Isn't it kind of slow to always have to be checking through the entire memory to see if that string's already there when you... Yeah, um, for the compiler, yeah. well, if it does it at compile time, it's okay. Because it just creates a simple table as it's compiling, mm -hmm. and th that would be like a tree... And it, yeah, it has to keep a single. It has to keep a simple table of all string literals. But if you think how many string literals are in a program, yeah. not so many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at runtime, it's a bigger. It's a bigger task, yeah. which is um, why you want to explicitly call this canonical function rather than having it happen automatically every time. It's up to you to make the decision. Is the cost of doing this going to um, be much less than the cost of yeah, not doing it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The other function you always get, it's very similar to double equals. But it's not as complicated to understand. In fact, it's probably only half as complicated to understand. What would we? Yes. Equals. Yes. The assignment. You always get an assignment. So given one thing, you get uh, an assignment sort of function on it. That, so if I've got an expression, you can assign it to something else. So if I've created a crazy type hunter, I'm allowed to say things like, did I do it here? I haven't done it yet. You're allowed to say h1 equals h2. You get that for free. Even if you didn't mean to give them an equals function, you, the assignment operation, you've given it to them. Now what happens here in C? Does that copy the values from one to the other? Or is it, well, it depends what you're doing. Now if you've got, well the rules in C are a bit funny. Does anyone remember them exactly? With structs, if you assign one struct to another struct, it copies it, but it only, I think, does a shallow copy. Yeah. So it only copies... If you've got two structs in C, S1 and S2, and you say S1 equals S2, C goes to a lot of work tootling along through here, copying everything from here up into here. But if you've got two pointers to structs in C... Oh, what am I going to call that? SP1, SP2, and you say SP1 equals SP2, then that actually just changes the pointer and doesn't do a copy. So you get different semantics when you're using assignment, whether if you're doing it on a, a using a reference or you're doing it on an actual object. So in, in Java, I just wanted to point out, and it's probably sort of obvious already, that if I say object one equals object two, am I doing a copy? No, I'm, I'm literally just changing a pointer to it. So if you want to do a copy, you actually got to do a bit of extra work. And in Java, if I compare two things with double equals, am I comparing their values or just comparing their pointers? Curses, I'm just comparing their pointers. If I want to compare their values, I've got to do a bit of extra work. And those two little bits of extra work are done so often that uh, there's a standard way of doing them in Java. Every object has a 
dot equals function given to it. And it comes with a default implementation and you can actually change it to do what you think equals should do. So you can't control this, but you can control what this does. And every object gets a, um, a copy. Oh, what's it called? Clone. A clone function. And gets given to you automatically. And every object gets this. And if you call dot clone on something, it makes a copy of it, but it's a real copy. And it copies all the fields across. And again, it's a shallow copy. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. So that took, that brief little aside there, took up uh, way too much time. So we're going to have a little break now. Then after the break, we will return and quickly do some coding. And I want to tell you about some design things.